Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Alexander Audio. And today my guest is Debbie Adams, who's a teacher of the Alexander Technique in Boston. She um, is also a nationally certified teacher of piano. She's a and she is a uh, a pianist and she has she teaches at the uh, Boston Conservatory of Music. She also teaches at the Alexander Technique Center at Cambridge, which is a Alexander Technique teacher training course, and she has a private practice in piano and the Alexander Technique in the Boston area. Uh, Debbie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for having me. Debbie and I are going to talk in this interview about an ob- uh, an experience that Debbie had during her Alexander training that led her to think in perhaps slightly different ways about uh, pain and injury, and she, 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 then, then some teachers might do, and she's going to talk about that with us today. Debbie, could you maybe start by just saying a little bit what your situation was and what it's led you, how it has affected your own teaching? Certainly. Um, I have played the piano for most of my life, and I think like many pianists, I went through several years being somewhat stiff, but not necessarily in pain and didn't know that anything was wrong. And I managed to get myself through a college degree in music um, before I actually discovered that there might be better ways to do things. And oddly enough, it was after I discovered that there were better ways to do things that I had a hand injury. And this injury was so severe that I couldn't hold a piece of paper in my hand, let alone play the piano. And um, I found my way to the Alexander Technique, which, as we all know, is rather life-changing in and of itself. And um, it was the first time anybody suggested I might be doing something that could contribute to my difficulty. That certainly wasn't the path the medical community was taking. (laughs) Um, So I eventually found my way to training to become a teacher. I wanted to be able to use my hands with my piano students the way that my Alexander teacher could with me and give them a direct experience of what it meant to have a free arm and so forth. So I started training to teach the technique and I had been studying this for some time and at at this time I was in Tommy Thompson's training course and I was still flirting with this notion of playing piano again. My life had taken a turn away from performing because of the injury. So I was doing a lot more teaching and I would spend more time on and off at the piano. And I went into class one day and I said, I just don't understand how come I've spent all this time on this technique and yet I can sit at the piano and in seconds I get this whiff of that old injury. What's going on? And Tommy said something rather simply. He said, it's it's all in the attitude that you bring to the piano. And this was at the end of class, and I went home, sat down at the piano, and as I raised my hands and arms to the instrument, I suddenly got a glimpse of myself that I had not gotten before. And it's a little difficult to describe, but I would say it was not true, it was not me, Um, I suddenly needed to be something other than what I was. It's the best way I can describe that. And as I saw that in myself, I was able to let it go because it certainly wasn't what I wanted to bring to the piano. And that was when I was healed from my pain. And it's an experience I will never forget. Um, We, I think, often as teachers can pay lip service to this notion that we're dealing with the whole person. It's sometimes easier to talk anatomically about physiological responses. And I think some of us are afraid to tackle these other parts of the person. But it is clear that when we respond to any stimulus, be it the piano or anything else in our lives, we are responding as a whole person. And the window in to discovering how we can Um, respond in a way that we would prefer to respond may not always be by freeing our neck and lengthening our spine. It may be by recognizing this other component of ourselves. 
Mm-hmm. What What do you think would happen, or would have happened, if you uh, had if this had happened in in say a typical Alexander lesson, where a teacher might have noticed perhaps a little tension in your neck or your shoulders as you began to play, and helped you with that? How would that be different from what you've just described? Um, it's different and it's not. You know, certainly the response that I noticed in myself that day had to have had a physiological component to it. Mm-hmm. It's all connected, that I know. But I certainly went to enough Alexander workshops over the years where I played the piano at these workshops and teachers helped me free my neck and lengthen my spine and all sorts of ideas that they had. Um, And it was always fine in the workshop. But in order for me to confront this myself, it involved a different way of me looking at what I call support. So if I'm in a setting with a teacher, there's a particular kind of support that I feel from the teacher that allows me to let go in a way that's incredibly comfortable. But how do I find that support when I'm home. And this is, I think, the question that a lot of our students bring to us, you know, how do I do this at home sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we do talk, or at least I talk to my students more about the thinking that's involved in allowing a different response to occur. I am always encouraging my students not to try to replicate the way it felt. Um, But when I had this experience, what I reached for in my support was this Um, I think, a sense of what I thought a pianist was supposed to be or something like that. I've been thinking a lot lately about Alexander's notion of faulty sensory appreciation. And I think it plays into this. Um, I used to think of it in terms of somebody who's rather upright and their head is straight, fine. If I walk around with my head tilted to the right long enough and then somebody suggests it straighten, I will feel like I've moved to the left. That was kind of my sense of faulty sense of appreciation. And lately I've been thinking of it in terms of support. So for instance, if, I, if I'm seated in a chair and I'm not feeling terribly comfortable, I might cross my legs. Well, what is that about when I cross my legs? It's about me seeking support some way. But I've deluded myself into thinking that I will find support by crossing my legs. And I think I deluded myself into thinking I would find support at the piano by becoming something other than who I was. Um, Mm -hmm. Do do you think another way of expressing it might be that there was this uh, image that, or an idea that would come into your head when you were seated at the piano that, yes, hey, I'm a pianist, and that would then color your your physical self a bit. And a teacher might see the coloring of your physical self, a little bit of tension or whatever, but might not have any insight into the what triggered that. I think that's very is, accurate. Is that, would that be? I'm, I'm thinking uh, on my uh, own training course many, many years ago, uh, one of the uh, directors was a man named Paul Collins, who's since died, but he he was a violinist. Uh, and one of the things that he would tell us is if you're working with a musician, uh, just as an example, and we're really using music as an example here, um, that, that if you would do very well to observe him or her as as they walk over and open the case even. Because Absolutely. you're going to see a lot of stuff going on if you're if you're looking for it. That's going to he didn't phrase it quite like this, but that's going to reflect their whole idea about what it was to now perform to be a violinist, as it were. Absolutely, this is a, an entire relationship that's set up between the performer and their instrument, the performer and their audience, the performer and all the past performance experiences they've had and the future ones they anticipate. And that's true of every activity we have. It's always this relationship that's set up mm-hmm. and it it happens immediately as soon as we acknowledge the relationship. So as an Alexander teacher, when you're working with a performer and it's could be as someone who does public speaking or 
someone who's a teacher, for example, a classroom mm-hmm. teacher, uh, lecturer, whatever. This and maybe let's say you're working with such a person and you help them to do better in your in their classes with you, but they keep coming back and saying, you know, when, when I when I actually do it, uh, I'm the old pattern just jumps back in Mm -hmm. that as a teacher, you might echo something along the lines of what Tommy told you. Is that, does that seem like a reasonable implication of what you're saying? It is, you know, I tend to talk to my students a lot about what they're thinking. I also do my best to observe them um, when they are actually in the performance situation, whether it's their workplace or it's a performance hall, um, because trying to simulate that in the teaching space is sometimes difficult. And I think that was the other bit that happened for me was that I was able to make this discovery for myself at my instrument, you know, in my space. And I think that's a very powerful experience for people. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that you would like to uh, add to what we've talked about? I think the only thing I, I want to just put a little bit of a highlight on is this notion of support. Because when our students feel supported, they don't need to hold themselves together, don't need to hold themselves up. And so our breathing mechanism functions more easily, our entire system functions more easily, our thinking is clearer. And so seeking an understanding as to how we reach for support and what is truly available to us for support in our surroundings is very valuable. And by support, uh, do you mean more than just physical support like the chair or the floor? I do, though often I will start with that. You know, it it's, can be a delicate process for people to go beyond that. But I have found that my students have tremendous insight um, I've had people say, I have these little post-its all over my office with little things that people have said in there. And one is that your support, let me see, I'm going to get this wrong. No, the limit of your awareness is the limit of your support. Mm -hmm. Um, So for most people, we tend to close down and narrow our attention as we're feeling unsupported and we reach in. And I'm always encouraging people to move in the opposite direction and reconnect to the world around them. Mm -hmm. And that echoes uh, advice that that other Alexander teachers have said, let's say, in connection with acting, uh, for example, that when you go out on stage, you you want your senses to be pretty wide open to the audience, to the other people on stage and it can if there's a little fear or anxiety it can very quickly result in a a narrowing of your field of attention absolutely and what are we doing out there if we don't want to connect with our audience anyway um. well that's <laughs> that's a question for another day yeah. well i i hope that this conversation has um has, has been helpful for teachers particularly teachers who work with people who are performers in the widest sense of that word. And of course, I suppose we should add here that everything we do is really a performance and even uh, something like standing up from a chair, uh, if it, it, it's quite possible, maybe even likely, that if you're not doing it well, one of the things you're not doing well is narrowing your your field of vision as you make that movement. Absolutely. So it's we're, I'm, I'm trying to generalize this so that really this is about about um, teaching in general. But certainly, uh, as your experience, uh, I think, is a good example of that people who perform, putting that in quotes, for a living, um, uh, those 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 issues can be magnified quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Debbie, thank you uh, so much for being on the show today. Thank you very much, Robert.